I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone Hi. to GM Tools, PCs as leaders. Today we're going to talk about what happens when your PCs, maybe just one, maybe all of them, want to be the leader of some kind of organization, whether it's joining a group that already exists, founding their own mage guild, or starting their own uh, like merchant enterprise, or any kind of sort of situation where the PCs are leading, not a PC like being a leader of the other PCs, that's mm -hmm. like a whole dynamic issue, but a PC that's sort of in charge of a bunch of NPCs that like Mostly are not just kind of come in and clog up your dungeon with bodies of low-level, like, tailors, but <laughs> are, like, doing something significant in the backdrop of downtime that is going to affect the world and the setting. So, we had another episode that was related to this, an organizations episode. We were talking about how to present engaging organizations but um, but this is really this is really more of a focus on what happens when the PCs are in that leadership role. So right. not not it's not like the PCs that... join the Knights yeah. of Last Wall. It's like no, now the PCs are in charge of the Knights of Last Wall. Or like if your PCs are have their own name, like Jill, then the Knights of Jill. Mm -hmm. So, there's been a fair number of published adventures that have the PCs in this sort of role. In, in Kingmaker, and, uh, and in Hell's Rebels, and in other APs like that, there are, there are systems that, um, that represent uh, PCs as leaders in 1st edition. Do you want to talk a little bit about what kinds of mechanics exist to support that in Pathfinder 2nd edition? Well, um, there's... A variety of different ways that you could go about it but the simplest way is to use the leadership su subsystem from chapter 3 subsystems of the game mastery guide now the leadership subsystem is designed to be very flexible for whatever kind of organization you need but also uh, not be so burdensome that it takes a massive amount of everybody's effort to like figure out what's going on with the leadership subsystem and uh, basically the way the leadership subsystem works in Game Mastery Guide is that rather than tell you, oh, you know what, your leadership score is such and such because you were blatantly disrespectful to your followers and so you want to recruit this blacksmith that you met, but you can't because you already have too many. It mm -hmm. sort of goes from the other direction, which is recruit people in game and maybe you do so an event that gives you more than one person at the same time as they join you, the, the, the process of gaining followers levels up your organization's level. And there's some sample um, numbers of followers that work pretty well for a standard campaign that you can have. And uh, they, so it's like, okay, it's not that because of, of how you've treated people, the most people you can have is 36 with a leadership level of eight. It's that if you get that 37th person, your organization level that you're le uh, the organization you're leading goes up to nine and that's sort of how it works um and there's some uh suggestions for bases of operations handling the npcs in the organizations and um sort of running leadership as a an ongoing thing that's happening in the background it's not exactly the same as downtime because of the fact that uh, even when the PCs aren't in downtime and they're adventuring for 10 days in a row, their, their, their organization is still doing their down. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not downtime for them. That's their life. They're doing yeah. their thing for 10 days still. And it makes sure to point out that um, when you have all these people working for you, it's not supposed to be some huge liability where you have to dump in money and it's useless other mm -hmm. than for bragging rights. It's also not supposed to be like some sweatshop where they just like robotically craft things for you and give you all of their life savings of money. Yeah, generally but, generally, if the PCs are running an organization there should be some investment that they need to do, some mi missions that they need to do, things that they need to do to recruit people, to assist people, and to have their organization be successful. But then in exchange for running the organization, they receive some benefits from that organization. So it feels like it's something that they 
that they invest in, that they build up, that they grow over time. And that has some challenges that are things that they, they might expect where it's like, okay, yes, if we're going to have this organization, we need to build a base of operations. If we're going to, if we need a blacksmith, we need to go recruit a blacksmith. But also that has some challenges that are, that are less expected. That's right. The Game Mastery Guide refers to the three types of things that might happen with your organization, which you should probably roughly evenly divide them by as troubles. That's where something bad happens and you legitimately, oh, you have to pay a tax now. Oh no, you need more money for this. Um, or monsters are attacking your caravan and you have to buy a new caravan or go off and fight them. This is just a problem that happened because of the fact that uh, you had the organization. Windfalls, that's just something great happened and it happened because of your organization. Oh, your, your tailors found an idea for a new type of clothes that really caught on and became popular and now you can't sell enough of them and you got some extra money. Or mm -hmm. your researching mages found an uncommon spell that was just... They found it in a bunch of scrolls and they give it to you. That's a windfall. Uh, obviously, any of these can be more complicated than the simple ones I'm describing. And then the third kind are opportunities. Those are where um, you have an option to make a choice. And depending on which choice you make, the consequences generally range from like either being neutral choices or uh, sort of a mix of good and bad results. So that... Uh, or sometimes the opportunities like require some amount of investment or doing something to get the um, the better result. So that that way, uh, basically on average, the um, the organization and the people that you're leading are helping you because mm -hmm. you get the best version of what you choose to do with the opportunity, which is probably net beneficial because you chose the best one plus the windfalls, and you have to deal with the troubles in return. And even then, some PCs enjoy, like, fighting off the goblins who were attacking their caravans, yeah. and they wouldn't mind that that much. Especially, uh, organizations can definitely give a, a fun opportunity to throw challenges at the PCs that are way under their level. Because uh, one, of, one of the things that, um, that, that I found, this definitely came with Kingmaker, is that um, PCs can tend to have a sense that if they hear about any problem that exists anywhere, then they should be the ones to go solve it. Mm -hmm. But having the PCs go and do some of these, like, really easy, low-reward missions, and then they're like, you know what, we should probably actually delegate and have other folks do this and help others train and learn through their experience. Um, I'm seeing Wither King here talking about a party of six players and, like, 20-something named NPCs of varying strengths. So when you've got a lot of NPCs tagging along with the party for whatever reason, um, it's good to sort of work with the players to set expectations for how much those NPCs are going to be, say, accompanying the PCs into combat. It can be fun to have a rotating cast and maybe you have one or two NPCs that's coming along at a given time, particularly more particularly if you have um, a smaller group, then that can help shore them up. But particularly if you have a larger group, or if you're adding a lot of NPCs that can really bog down combat or cause issues where those NPCs are substantially lower level and are just getting themselves killed. That's right. And in fact, the leadership subsystem in Game Mystery Guide specifically says that you should not have them accompany the PCs on adventures. Although in the cohorts and new PCs section, it says sometimes the organization is a good plot hook to introduce an NPC to travel on with the party or a new PC, even if a new player comes in and wants mm -hmm. a hook to join the party. Um, and gave an example, the PCs are running their own mercenary army, so a rising officer might join up as the new PC. Mm -hmm. um, and But in that case, they would be treated like an additional character in the party with an enriched story that ties them to the PCs. They are not just one of these random followers. They they should be on equal footing, other than the fact that maybe the, MP, the GM is playing them to the other PCs, but by mm -hmm. default, um, these other characters that you have do not adventure with you. And in a lot of cases, they're going to be substantially lower level than the PCs, so that they're not overshadowing them. So it can be fun, and I know this is something we've talked about in past episodes, but to have the, the players take on the role of some of these characters from their organization and do some of these side missions so they get to see a bit of a different side of things. Right. Because, you'll, because it's good for an organization to have... Um, some smaller group of people that the PCs get to know who are named characters that are really fully fleshed out. Like, if you've got an organization with hundreds of members, 
then it's not worth naming and giving personalities and backstories to all of them. You'd but just Linda, my level 20 it. organization has 2,400 members, followers up to level 4, and 240 lieutenants up to level 9. But I would Can't say... we at least have a back, fully fleshed out backstory for the 240 level 9 lieutenants? No. I mean, you can, <laughs> but I would highly recommend against it. Yeah, so picking picking a few touchstone NPCs who can be sort of the... They, they don't have to be, like, necessarily even the leaders of subgroups, so those are good uh, good touchstones, but they can also be NPCs who, are, who you think that your players will be particularly interested in for some reason or another. Play, or NPCs that your players have met organically throughout time because if you have any because it's a lot more effective to introduce npcs as oh you know here's this little adventure that you do and you've recruited this new npc and now they're part of the group as opposed to you know the pcs walk into a room and there's 20 people and they just met all of them in that time but in terms of uh in terms of situations with a fair number of npcs advice that we've given in the past there certainly still applies with um giving the players resources be those uh this can't online a wiki for example that has a list of the npcs and uh that they or other resource that has a list of the npcs with some basic notes that the players can create themselves or you as the gm can create and have available to them having art and catchphrases and other ways to help distinguish uh, those npcs from each other so that it's easier for players to keep track of who it is that they're actually leading so wither king asks are hirelings considered in the same boat so hirelings as per Court rule book rules for paying for someone on an hourly or daily basis to do a thing for you would not be considered someone who's part of your organization necessarily. Mm -hmm. They're kind of a freelancer who you've just said, okay, I'm going to hire this dung sweeper to sweep up the dung mm -hmm. behind my horse. I mean, that being said, if you have a hireling that comes into your game and the players really get attached to this particular hireling and there's a good reason why you think they would be interested in the PC's cause, that can absolutely be a way yeah, to Yeah, the hireling could join the organization. Yeah, exactly. And just become a permanent fixture. But normally the hireling, the moment you stop paying them, they're like, okay, and they find someone else to sweep up the dung. Or if they're mm -hmm. a scholar to... Do extra research notes for you or whatever you're having the hireling do yeah so when you have your organization there's going to be the people who who join your organization certainly the people you're trying to recruit and there's also going to be people who are enemies of your organization and rivals of your organization and those people are not always going to directly target the pcs with what they do i mean the pcs as the leaders of the organization do definitely have more targets on their backs mm -hmm. but their other members are going to be more more vulnerable to to other situations coming up and this right. is certainly something to be careful with like you don't want the the players to feel like oh yeah you know the, this thing happened to my organization and it got ruined and there was nothing i could have possibly done to prevent it but having the organization have setbacks and issues and things and problems that the NPCs can't resolve on their own as a result of uh, as a result of rivals or needing to take some time to make precautions against those rivals. There's there are a few things I find more satisfying in a game than making a plan to protect against something and then watching that plan uh, watching that plan be successful. So mm -hmm. um, having the chance to, to do that as well. Then you're like, okay, that could have gone really badly if I hadn't made that plan. Yeah. And the NPCs um, in the organization have a lot of ability to notice things that the PCs don't while they're off on their adventures. So even if the PCs are not literally there when their precautions or their plans do good things, or when they don't go so well, the NPCs can certainly report on those. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the to the broader sense, though, the NPCs can be sort of the eyes and ears of the PCs, and in a lot of other ways too, to help them, um, to help them find opportunities, to help them find missions, to help them understand kind of what's going on in the world. Yep. So that's sort of what you can do in terms of using the the game mastery guide subsystem to easily determine like what level the organization is how many members you can have and it mentions structuring that usually organizations have about twice as many um as a rule of thumb twice as many npcs of a given level as that of the next higher level so that you can sort of structure it as a pyramid so you don't wind up with the 2400 level four followers like i was saying instead you have 2400 and of those 
there's half as many level fours as level threes, half as many level threes as level twos, half as many level twos as level ones, and so on. Uh, all the way down to your level negative one followers who always make up a lot of your followers. Mm -hmm. uh, half your followers, even. Plus one. <laughs> uh, but um, there's more to it than that. Because when the PCs want to be leaders, that doesn't just necessarily mean that they want to have a giant organization uh, structurally mm -hmm. and story-wise, an organization that creates plot. That definitely is part of it. But another part of the PCs being leaders is the way that they want... They want to, the player wants to feel, and that they want their character to feel like that character is a strong leader and is a good leader. Um, unless they, mm -hmm. I mean, they may want to be playing one who is a bad leader on purpose, just yeah. sort of for the comedy of being a bad leader. But in most cases, is someone who is an effective leader. And that can wind up being a little bit more challenging if the player is an incredibly ineffective leader. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there are techniques and tools you can use to help assist with that. So first of all, um, the the big question is um, is why would these NPCs follow the PCs? Is it were the PCs officially appointed to a role and then they need to earn people's trust? Did the PCs were the PCs elevated to a role either officially or unofficially because of their deeds and then they sort of come with this? group of people who share their perspectives and ideals who want to follow them. There, there's a really big difference between sort of those two situations. Right. Of, For in terms of their, of the in terms PCs of their foundation. Who is being a leader, and mm -hmm. it might be that they're leaders of different groups that they all founded their own group, you should come up with at least one, but possibly more, of those reasons, like Linda was saying. Mm -hmm. Sort of this is a draw. This is why or how this person attracts people. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, let's say you have an aloof elven wizard who does not like any ancestries except for elves mm -hmm. and um, loves magic, is a genius, and wants to form an elven mages guild for only elves who mm -hmm. are also wizards. Yes. So, obviously, being friendly and welcoming and opening are not going to be kind of the draw. But... The draw of brilliance, of genius. Mm -hmm. um, just of, the fact oh that, man, you might be able to get these uncommon spells that this person right. has been, or rare spells this person has been researching and get access to this great training. So the genius of the PC as a whole, of like being around and working for somebody who's this great genius, so personal power. Mm -hmm. And then also, as Linda said, uh, not just the personal power of the wizard, but like magical benefits mm -hmm. for the person joining the organization, right? So, direct benefits in terms of that could be, like, I gain access to new magic. It could be I get money. It could be this is good for my social standing. Right. It could be any number of ways that that, that benefits the PC. So, you want to take into account... Or the NPC, really. You want to take into account what those are when you're deciding what happens with the organization. This will also help you decide some of the events that are happening, opportunities, troubles, and windfalls. It, it also determines, like, what matters that the PC does. For instance, if the PC has the reputation I mentioned with that elven mage and they're a jerk to everybody, that's not really going to necessarily make them lose followers. But if or the PC has a anymore. reputation for being, like, an honorable paladin who never backs down and was, is going to lead people into battle and set, and set a heroic example and then... And then there's an, then like it becomes widely known that they did this that they were actually did this dishonorable away. deeds and and stole a lot of things and ran away. Then they're gonna lose folks from that. So right. thinking about what it is that their reputation is, uh, both both in terms Whereas of like, the strengths that draw people in, the weaknesses that push people away, and how losing those strengths or mitigating those weaknesses might change the way that people see them. It's a lot. It's certainly a lot harder for a PC to to get past a sort of a negative first impression than it is mm -hmm. to... So that the first, how, what is their first impression that they make on people as well is, is important to think about. Like if the PCs are new to a particular region and they come in, what are those adventures they've done? What are the stories that are being told about your PCs? Mm -hmm. And who is telling them? Right. So like for the elven wizard, being a jerk, that doesn't matter. He's That's not why... The Elven Wizard's mages mm -hmm. joined that mages guild. But if the Elven Wizard is 
does something stupid or mm -hmm. just messes up and um, makes a big mistake, that matters more. Whereas making a mistake might not matter for, like, the kindly bard that everyone likes. It's like, yeah, he made a mistake. He's a lovable bard. Mm -hmm. But making a big mistake, the elf might lose a lot of leadership. Or just being greedy and hoarding his magic to himself when one of the main reasons they wanted to join was to improve their own magic and they thought they would gain magic power from this powerful mage sharing it with them. That has a pretty big effect on that mage and on that organization. Um, it, whereas in some cases, fixing up the flaw of a PC leader might actually not help the PC leader gain more people mm -hmm. if the flaw has at some point drawn like-minded individuals. So, yeah. for example, if this elf has drawn a bunch of xenophobic elven mages who all don't like the mm -hmm. other ancestries, but then he has a change of heart because he was reading the Lost Omen's World Guide and he's like, oh gosh, my whole ancestry's been retconned to really <laughs> love all the other ancestries. What have I been doing? I don't know. I love everyone, and they all join the organization now. Mm -hmm. And then his fellow ma xenophobic elven mages might be very unhappy that uh, he's done that. He might lose some of his old members, but gain some new ones because he's willing to, um, yeah. to accept those. Yeah, and certainly those. the PC's character development over time is going to influence who wants to follow them. Thanks for the sub, Joe. Uh, yeah, thanks. We have a question from Kay the Sinister. Any pitfalls you would warn players to avoid? Things along the lines of don't plug up gameplay, bringing a dozen minions everywhere. Absolutely. I mean, if you have the minions following the, following the group, it's generally good to have those be um, under, under the GM's purview. Rather than uh, rather than risking them become like the player talking to their own familiar times ten with right. all these other with all this other giant retinue. And that's as Game along. Master Guide says, you should pretty much never have all of them following the PCs group. Yeah. But you might, even though you didn't, you might have them all around because yeah. the PCs might use the place where they all are as a base. And yeah. Be doing or a session. Or you might be that's like, there. say, on a caravan that's traveling, and so you have those. You oh, have yeah. those people. So with they'd you. be around. And I would so... say too, if you have, um, if you have certain players that are more interested in the organization than others, there's absolutely a good opportunity to have sessions that don't include everybody. So if you're like, okay, these two players are super interested in role playing and building up this organization, and. And these two players just want to see the benefits of the organization, and they don't really care about, like, the backstories of these NPCs. You can totally do sessions with those two players that are like, hey, we're going to do a, set, a short really session where we're going to go in-depth with these NPCs but and then this kind of thing. You then, can, yeah. when you hit something that's like, okay, this is actually a story about a trouble or an <laughs> opportunity, we're going to pause and bring in the others, because the other players probably still do care about something as big ticket as... yeah. Oh, well, it'd be like, okay, some things happened and you, your characters didn't really care about that, that's that much. It was personal stuff <laughs> with the, with, with the followers, but an undead horde is, has been rising up and the undead horde has been stealing your jelly beans that your <laughs> jelly bean factory has been making and that was your organization. So, um, now it's time for all of you to figure out what to do about the undead horde or else jelly bean profits are going down. Yeah. I mean, that's good advice for sort of subsystems in general is that you can have those little side sessions via email or text or chat or any other means that you want to, to flesh out things that some players are interested in, some players not so much. That's right. And, and, and the question that we were answering also mentioned about bringing a dozen minions. So minion is a game term for a creature that you have that you sort of command on your turn. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely um, not really going to be something you do with leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. if you did get a character with leadership, it, um, and you did bring them along, um, like we were mentioning with cohorts and new PCs, that would be because you wanted to fill up the group with more PCs mm -hmm. and you chose to use the leadership as an excuse. And with you meaning the GM, possibly with the player's permission on that. Um, yeah. if there was a way to get like a minion that was like vaguely a humanoid, like, um, a, a squire type class feature that mm -hmm. would that would have to be like something that was in the character's class where it was like well yeah this knight class has a squire our minion as a feature who and can we've also, help um, prepare their weapons the jam can also use as a tool um something that we've used in uh, organized play adventures sometimes which is sort of bespoke minions for adventures where it's like here the pcs have these allies and we're kind of using the minion rules as a as a shorthand to describe how the PCs can queue in these allies to assist them. Yep. Yeah, I've seen that you guys have given it like a bespoke action where 
like they'll fire a giant cannon at the enemy or yeah, do something else. Yeah, just sort else. of it is a way to is a way to make it so the PCs are still directing the action and you're not super clogging up the field with mm -hmm. with actions. Yes. Uh, the point being that the minion is a game term and sort of a game based ability, but there should never be a situation where something you did in the story just sort of forces the GM and the other players to cause your character to gain minions, and you did it you didn't pay for in some kind of game currency, mm -hmm. either a magic item that summons that minion or a feat that gives you a minion or something like that. And there's a question. Um, speaking of my Tyrant Hoglobin, could I have a lawful evil leader and have lawful good or, or something crazy like pay a good followers? Are there alignment rules for the system? The system doesn't directly say like you must be within bloody blah steps or fewer but it's more of a matter of thinking about what we were saying before about why would these people follow this particular leader that's right and that's why it's been turned around in pathfinder second edition pathfinder first edition right it was oh yeah you're you have a leadership of 12 just go you you automatically have 50 people and they have to be this alignment or that that restriction but in pathfinder second edition because it goes in the other direction get more followers that's what levels mm -hmm. you up well yeah, your lovely little hobgoblin hits it off with a chaotic good elf for some reason. That sounds really implausible since mm -hmm. you would probably be yelling about elf magic all the time. But, <laughs> but hey, it works out and you, you, your hobgoblin is like, listen, thank you for the Cantorian spring. It freed, uh, <laughs> it freed the hobgoblin ancestry. I understand this. Well, my brethren do not. I may be evil, but I will help you. And you have a great role playing session mm -hmm. and the elf says, I will join your evil army even though I'm chaotic good. Then, yeah, you add them right yeah. into your followers. Certainly, and then that can help um, you level. It's going to be harder by a <laughs> lot. <laughs> and certainly the, these NPCs with vastly divergent worldviews and perspectives, whether they're a lemon or not, I mean, a lemon is an easy shorthand for that, but are much more likely to be ones who are going to be creating sort of having different visions for where they want to see the organization going. Or different mm -hmm. ideas. Like if you are a lawful, if you're a lawful good organization, you have some lawful evil that joins the the a leader of an organization. You have some lawful evil who joins it because they're like, yes, they're a rightful authority, but they're really stuck up on this good stuff. So I'm just gonna kind of do these things over here. Then I'm the one be, who does what needs to then, be then done. Then that might be something that the PCs <laughs> then have to deal with. Is like, it is like, Vizier did what? <laughs> So Kay the Sinister, uh, who had asked the previous question about dozens of backup, founded a Temple of Norgor where War for the Crown. So War for the Crown mm -hmm. actually also has the Persona system, written by Linda, mm -hmm. um, which has another way of dealing with having many agents that is its own kind of separate system. It's it. I found that it was close enough to system neutral that with small amounts of updating when I ran my second edition version of War for the Crown... I was able to mostly use the And that one really system. focuses on why, what it is about the PC that inspires people to follow them. Right. So is it their... Like we were talking yeah, is it their Is it their heroism? Is it, the, is it the sense that they have, like, a strong reputation for being someone who's self-sacrificing? Is, is it that they are brilliant, et cetera, et cetera? Or devious. Or devious and, and good at mm -hmm. subterfuge and things like that. Yep. Or if you're, or if you're, yeah, I think the, yeah, there was, there was sort like of the evil variant charming. that was like. Oh yeah, you, yeah, I remember there was the yeah. evil variant that replaced being self-sacrificing with, with being, being like, like really intimidating and yes, terrorizing people. Yeah, exactly. Being super ruthless. Yeah. Yep. So really, uh, the leadership subsystem uh, for second edition goes the 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 sky's the limit and you mm -hmm. can you could recruit anyone that you could possibly conceive of as long as and, and even though it has max follower levels and lieutenant level life if you want someone who doesn't have enough leadership for a level seven monster to be one of their lieutenants mm -hmm. but just to have them join as lieutenant above the expected yeah the gm can totally decide your gm can be like yeah sure yeah okay your group may only have 11 leadership which means your lieutenants go up to fourth level, but this seventh level monster joins your cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing too you can consider is if if, if the um, if the NPC is sufficiently more powerful, then maybe they are allies rather than directly working under the PCs. Mm hmm. Definitely. And yeah, basically, you want to take everything into account. It should make sense. It should be true to the characters. 
And in some cases, like we were saying, when you have 2,400 members, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be one at a time with a name and a backstory for all of them. You can have an event where it's like you throw a giant rally in the town square and 40 negative lo one level commoners mm -hmm. join your group. And you don't have to name them all. You can just say plus 40. Yeah. Right? And, and th that's... That's a relevant amount because if you were starting, just got to level 19, you needed 500 more. So that's almost 10% of the amount you needed to level up, mm -hmm. for example. And as you start to get, the group starts to get larger, naming rather, rather than naming individual people, naming, uh, naming sort of subgroups within the organizations. Yeah. It's like, you know, these are our... It's like these are our secret and the, these are our like private eyes and these are our the, these are our trap specialists and these are our whatever right and and giving different names can also mean that those sub factions have their own different agendas mm -hmm. like you could have the sandal list who are barefooted peasants who um of your group are more radical than the rest of the group because they want a peasant rebellion but mm -hmm. they follow the pcs and that might be different than the private eyes who are mostly just trying to find useful information that they can use to um, to for political intrigue. Yeah. And not necessarily to have a peasant rebellion or uh, or what yeah. have you. So it's a good way to sort of think about the organization and, and factions and clumps. And then having, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier in this, that you have these, uh, having sort of individual representatives from those in, from those groups to be sort of the, the touchstone face. If the PCs want to get into role playing things out in more detail, I mean, you could obviously just say like, "Oh, you know, you receive a report from your from your spy network that Lord that Lord Beaumont was seen sneaking out of the castle at, at, at odd hours." Not Lord Beaumont. Yes, and uh, and <gasps> and, then, and then shortly thereafter, it was reported that the that the old imperial fan was missing, or what have you. But isn't he the Duchess's nephew? Gasp. <gasps> <laughs> yeah. So you can decide whether it's sort of a this group says blah, or whether you want to play out the scene. And I find that in a lot of cases when. Um, Subsystems tend to go from a more zoomed in to zoomed out perspective as as people get more accustomed to them and as the amount that's getting managed gets larger. So if you have a level one organization and you have like seven people in it, you may well know everybody's name, but then as it as it zooms out the, the PC's concerns the PC's concerns get more and more abstract and more and more okay, this is what we're gonna do with this wing or faction that's right i mean if you wanted to have like a random trapper who joined your organization then um are if you gonna read no i'm not but i'm gonna see how many words are in it. the the anton the trapper entry who was a random random trapper in kingmaker so that's just because you paraphrase Chekhov's wikipedia and not Chekhov's wikipedia entry and made, a ver and made a version of it that was Galarian. There's a 2,866 word <laughs> entry for a random trapper who yes. came into our kingdom at one point in time named Anton the Trapper. Yes. <laughs> Don't do this if you have an organization that has 4,000, or how many did we say? 2,400 2, members. Whatever, yeah. Do not. Because at that point you will have written like... Uh, seven million. Sort of, words. I mean, it sort of gets to the <laughs> to the general GM advice of don't bring in things into huge amounts of detail when you don't need to. Mm hmm. Um, but for organizations, as with any other situation where you might need NPCs to come up with NPCs on the fly, having a list of some basic names and personality traits and appearances that you can just grab whenever you need to suddenly throw an NPC together because the player said. Oh yeah, you know. Well, we probably have a group of people in this organization that are. Uh, it's like, well, we have a thousand people in our organization. Surely, uh, surely some of them must be farmers. I want to go talk to one of the farmers in our organization about some of the strange things that have been going out uh, that have been going on out with the plants that we've been discovering in this area, and have so you having those kinds of things so you can easily put together NPCs is very helpful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, you posted you posted, I posted the beginning the of it. That's right. <laughs> Anywho. Yep. So let's see. 
I think that we've given a pretty good baseline uh, level description for how to have sort of a powerful experience with leadership without it overtaking your game in, in too many minutia or sort of making a system that fights with itself to prevent you from mm -hmm. experiencing what happens in the game. Uh, Let's talk a bit about uh, the base of operations point, though. We haven't really okay. gotten into that and sort of how you how, how you form one of those. I think that... Um, so when you, definitely when, you, when you're starting with a low-level organization, it could easily just be like the PC's house or some ta or the back room in some tavern that they frequent or something like that. But as mm -hmm. they grow, uh, as they grow, they're going to need more and more space. And their organization is probably going to come to develop side bases that they, they go right. to. They may have, they may have places where it's like, this is where we keep our treasure. This is where we, this is where we handle these sorts of things. They may have bases in multiple cities. So paying attention yep. to, that sort of network also helps in where people are located, helps to establish where the PCs can call on their um, their allies for, for reinforcement and aid. The Game Mastery Guide suggests that you might have an a base like immediately on founding an organization, it's possible, mm -hmm. but that pretty much an organization needs to have one by sixth level unless the specifics of the organization story really demand that you can't have one. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's immobile. It could be like a circus, like in Extinction Curse, or a mm -hmm. caravan, like in Jade Region, some kind of a flagship or fleet, for like in Skull and Shackles, although you also wind up with an island there, so you can yeah. have multiple different bases of operation, like Linda was saying. If the PC, particularly if the PCs are running an organization that has um, that has some degree of secrecy to it, like they are... They are working on a, a rebellion against uh, the tyrannical forces of hell or something like that. Having sort of multiple layers of, of bases. The, this is the public base where, where, we have, where we have certain things that go on, but that is definitely keeps completely above board. And this is the secret base where we, where we have our most consequential meetings. It's a secret. Is, is quite useful. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sorry, were you going to go off into another topic there? Nope, I wanted to nope. finish that before that we... That was it. Uh... All right, do folks have any other questions on PCs as leaders? Let's see. Preferences about flying pyramids. Those can be those can be a good base. Um, vigilante having an ability to try to protect their base from divinations. Mm -hmm. I would say... Um, one, one other consideration is the, the fact that PCs don't behave like actual people, really, um, in terms of certain things. Like, PCs can be very reluctant to share any amount of their resources or to, to provide or to provide assistance to uh, or to provide assistance to others. Or, like, if they're not seeing an immediate payoff for, like, this in terms of, oh, my gold piece amount has gone down because I, because I've done this. So making sure that you're, you're showing both the, you're showing sort of the, the benefits that the PCs are getting from the organization. And also, in some cases, the costs if the PCs are like, no, we're just going to expect these people to do all these things for us and we're not going to do anything in return. Then if people start to question like why am i in this organization and they have a mission where it's like okay now we need to prove why people should be in this organization it can it can get some interesting uh dynamics and food for thought if that's something that the players are into exploring i remember that pcs and the players who play pcs are the same players who play a video game where you might have the ability to like donate thousands and thousands of your money like 10 gold pieces at a time um, mm -hmm. to a beggar on the street in the video game. And people might do that until they've lost thousands of their money. But if they don't get an ultimate sword or some kind of random thing from the beggar mm -hmm. after enough times, they'll get mad. So <laughs> similarly, uh, mm -hmm. similarly, many uh, players want to see a benefit out of the money that they put mm -hmm. in. And what can be even more problematic is even if you have a player who's not like that, who's like, well, no, I'm a paladin, so I'm just going to donate half of whatever I get to charity, and I don't expect anything from it. The players of the other characters could wind up getting mad and feel mm -hmm. like uh, if later, like, the paladin goes down and they didn't have a good armor because they, they, they go down mm -hmm. and then that caused the other people who are behind them to get attacked and killed, be like, you killed us by donating that money to charity. So it could be something that, like, even if 
the person who's not the one who puts the money into or the resource into that way could wind up being the one that caught that like has issues with it. So I would say that if you have uh, if you have a campaign where there's an expectation that the PCs are going to spend some amount of their wealth on an outside organization, just being upfront with the players and telling them, "Hey, you know, this campaign is going to drop more treasure than normal because there's an expectation that you have this organization that you're going to be building." So you can sort of set that foundation from the beginning and they're not feeling like uh, they're, they're not feeling like they're going to be sort of missing out or worried about the way that they're playing or whether their characters are going to be strong enough. Right. Exactly. That's why it's good that the leadership system in the Game Mastery Guide sort of establishes the idea that it's a net positive, but not by a huge amount, because it's going to give you these positive things that happen and these negative things that happen with about equal probability. And then this other neutral thing where you get to nudge this between several options that have some good and some bad or are mostly neutral. And you eke out your advantage from there. Or from mitigating the bad things by sending your PCs in to adventure. So, but in that case, you did an adventure which normally has rewards anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So the leadership system... If you get money from killing the skeletons that were the problem in the leadership system, you got money because you killed skeletons, which were adventuring. So it all sort of works out in mm -hmm. that way. And that way you can tell the players, look, so it's going to be revenue neutral or slight benefit. It's, you're not throwing anything away, but this is also not going to be some way that you just suddenly become gold barons. Um, it's going to be just another part of the adventure if that's what you're interested in playing. Mm -hmm. Joe says even with extra funds, you know, some players who will still say, no, my money's, I can buy extra gear. Mm -hmm. And I would say in that case, they can buy extra gear, but then they will receive fewer benefits from the, from the organization that they lead because they haven't, they haven't put resources into it. Alternatively, you can, um, you can track the organization's resources in a different abstracted currency such as build points or something else like that, that is, or like the starship build points. And in. try to make sure there's no way to go back and forth. Yeah. Like um, in Extinction Curse for the Circus, there are resources that you can get from putting on a good circus, but you can only use them to improve your circus. You can't use them to just be like the world's richest clown who murders everyone with, with weapons that are ten times more valuable than... That every other clown has. Yeah. Because then in that sense, the, that resource is representing not just, oh, the, my ability to buy a really powerful magic item uh, versus um, versus my ability to, to, like, build a castle. Like, well, maybe when you're building a castle, there are people like, no, I'm not just going to give you money to buy a magic item. But, but you know, you can call in favors with the Mason's Guild and a variety of other things to, to get the castle built. Wither King puts out the Skull and Shackles problem where you are raiding and capturing ships that sell for so much money if mm -hmm. you don't keep the ships. And that's definitely true. Skull and Shackles doesn't really have a defense against it. So uh, in Linda and my game, we just, like, our, the, our group just kept all of the ships mm -hmm. and decided we're going to make a giant fleet. But we easily could have just said, nah, we only need our flagship and then had hundreds of thousands of yeah. gold more. And if the PCs get, if the, yeah, and then that, that would be choosing to have a smaller organization, a smaller fleet of allies that you could call upon. But there was no defense against it there. Yeah, there was it, no defense. It is smart, like we were saying here before, to put in a blockade that prevents you from converting the organization's resources directly into PC resources. Because the same players, uh, like Joe said earlier in the episode, just a, a few minutes ago, is like, even if the players have extra funds, for some players, there's just this sense of, oh, but this could be money, it could be more gear. But those same players, if they have enough, not if you're starving them for money, right? But if they have a an, an reasonable amount, and you tell them, oh, this can't be converted, they usually mm -hmm. be like, oh, okay, that can't be converted. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's good. We're going to play. But if you don't tell them they can't be converted, and you say, oh, yeah, you can convert it, and by gear, they feel like they have to buy gear. Um, it's, it is just sort of... a it's a psychological effect that is something that, that is felt by some number of people uh, mm -hmm. who get anxious about um, their their strength in fights and want to just shore up all of their possibilities on that regard. And Kay the Center is a good point that um, 
that in many cases it may not be realistic for the PCs to sell off the all mm -hmm. the things that the resources that they have, or that if they could sell them off, they get a they would get a vastly inferior benefit. Mm -hmm. So even even players even players who would say like oh yeah you know I'd like to use these things for for myself like if they get like five or ten percent of the value for selling it off, then suddenly they'll be looking a lot more to be like oh no that's much better if we spend it in this way. Right. And it depends on exactly how much money it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if it's a cart that's, like, 50 GP, then getting 5% of that is, like, almost, is very little. Even in second edition yeah. where well, gold can, is worth can, more. Yeah, you can sell something like if that. If it's a giant more. warship, even 10% yeah. of that in, in, let's see, like, in Pathfinder second edition, how mm -hmm. much is a warship worth now? We have, how about a sailing ship? That's not even a warship. That That's only a level 9 vehicle. Mm -hmm. So that's 2,000 gold in second edition. Mm -hmm. So it's very reasonable that at a low level you might encounter a selling ship, somehow steal it. Mm -hmm. If you were able to sell it for half, you'd wind up with 1,000 gold, which would allow you to buy, like if your low level group, second level PCs stole a selling ship and sold mm -hmm. for half, you could buy 10 plus one striking weapons for them. Mm -hmm. Even if you sold it for 10%, you could buy two plus one striking weapons. Yeah. It's okay sometimes for the PCs to be somewhat over-treasured. If they're dramatically over-treasured, then that's the point in which it's worth considering, like, whether whether they are actually the level they seem to be in terms of their challenge as a party or whether you should kick up their, uh, kick up sort of their effective XP that you're using. So, like, treat a party of four characters who are super over-treasured as if they were a party of six characters for the purposes of determining how difficult right. their encounter should be. The trick so becomes when them. you have, like, say, maybe the GM and one of the players wants them to have a sailing ship, which they mm -hmm. currently have, and the other three players want to buy ten plus one striking weapons, or maybe they want to buy four plus mm -hmm. one striking weapons and some plus one armors. Yeah. Well, in that case, you'd probably want to make there be a reason in the story why having a sailing ship is very advantageous. Because if you're going to give them a sailing ship, then there should be like a, then there should be some kind of plot reason why it's it's good for them to to have a ship. Yep. Also, there can be a plot reason why selling it is going to be a problem. Where like, oh, this is everyone knows that you just stole this ship. Mm -hmm. They know who you stole it from. You're going to have to at least sail it to a port. Far, uh, far away from here before mm -hmm. you can find somewhere you can sell it or take it to a squib um, to have it um, squibbed off the, the obvious markings mm -hmm. and then you're going to have to pay for that Yeah. Um, and then sell it after you pay it so you're not going to make as much profit or some explanation like that might be mm -hmm. a, go a long way or, or just yeah. frankly like we were saying before just telling telling the players like for the purpose of this game, we we're gonna do some things with sailing. So mm -hmm. the sailing subsystem, I'm gonna give you stuff, and you can't yeah, sell. Yeah, you can't like, sell it for I personal money. I gave you a money. free ship. This doesn't count against your wealth in any yes. way, but just don't sell it yes. because this is here to be your transport. Exactly. So depending on your group, mm -hmm. e any of those different strategies might be best. Sometimes just openly saying it like that is the most effective, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not because they'll be like, "Well, but why? There's no reason." So uh, mm -hmm. any of these can work. Generally, if you do leadership in games, you should do it because players are interested in leadership, and so mm -hmm. they'll meet you halfway. The problem becomes when it's like not the whole group, and somebody else wants to try to get lots of personal wealth from that. But there's still a lot of techniques you can use to um, to work with that. Yeah. Alrighty, so I think we are good. So why don't we go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube? All right, bye YouTube.